Experts are calling it an unprecedented aviation mystery. Malaysian Airlines Flight 370 vanished on Friday with 227 passengers and 12 crew members aboard. 40 ships and 34 planes from 10 nations are searching for the Boeing 777. So far, they've come up empty. Those mile-long oil slicks in the South China Sea, not related to the plane. Reports of a plane door and a tail found turned out to be untrue. We do, we do know that there were at least two people on that plane using stolen passports. So do we need to start asking questions that the Blaze's vice president of digital content asked earlier on Twitter today? He said, when do we start seriously freaking out that an enormous airplane with 200 people on board disappeared three days ago? Good question. Joining me for tonight's Q&A is Jeff Price. Jeff is an associate professor at the Metropolitan State University of Denver in the, uh, I'm sorry, University of Denver in the Department of Aviation and Aerospace Science. It's a long title. And the owner of Leading Edge Strategies. He's an expert in aviation security. Thank you for joining us. Absolutely. Thank you, Tara. So my first question to you is when you, as an aviation expert, look at something like this, this is extremely, extremely rare. For it to go three days without any sign of the plane, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Well, one of two things, either terrorism or some sort of catastrophic mishap that occurred just so quickly and so violently that nobody had time to respond to act or to or to send out any sort of communication and uh, both incidents have happened in aviation both on the safety and security side so those are those are the two things that quickly come to mind so when you say catastrophic uh, catastrophic event are we talking about a mid-air disintegration since there's no debris yet it's been three days i think the flight from um the last time this happened was the air france flight and that took two days to find something but are we talking a mid-air disintegration are we talking an explosion a bomb well, we could be talking either one. The, uh, the Air France flight is a great example because uh, it's something that happened and happened so rapidly that there was very little response time and it goes down in the ocean. And also coming down from altitude, something drops from 30,000 feet. Doesn't matter that it hits water. It's like hitting concrete from that right. altitude. So you're going to get just mass vaporization of, of whatever was coming out of the sky. Uh, plus, it'll break apart as it's coming down from the sky as well. So a bomb could cause that or it could be some sort of safety issue or mechanical issue uh, or even a hazardous material issue that occurred just so rapidly. Nobody had time to respond or to get a communication out. Now, Falling from that altitude, there's not a lot left. Sure. What about the safety record of Malaysian Airlines? I know they've been financially uh, unprofitable for the last couple of years, but as far as safety concerns um, with the Boeing 777 or Malaysia Airlines, have there been any consistent safety concerns that might have led to a mechanical malfunction here? Can't really speak directly to, to the Malaysian Airlines safety record. I'm not as familiar with that particular airline. I don't, I don't blame uh, you. <laughs> and their safety record. But uh, the 777 has a great reputation. Uh, the Boeing 777 has been a reliable airframe for a long time uh, with a great reputation. So that's, that's not something they just rolled out the floor last week and were testing it out. Uh, the 777's been in business for a long time with, with a good safety record. Right. Um, it's my, my understanding, I think, that it had a safety check 10 days ago. So it doesn't look like it was a, a safety issue, but I just wanted to get that out on the table. Um, now, there had been reports that the radar, they just lost contact. Now, I can throw up a map here for people to see kind of where they were, the path of the, of the flight. They said that they think that it was trying to tur possibly turn around and come back. How would they know? What, what kind of um, detection operations do they have other than radar would to be able to show pinpoint the basic areas because my question is once it disappeared wouldn't they be able to basically know where it was yeah, that's yeah that seems contradictory if, right. if it's off radar if it's disappeared off radar then there's very little other technologies that are widespread they're available but they're not widespread yet that broadcast the position of an aircraft uh, those those are technologies that are that are around they're in advancement but uh, really radar is, is the primary way you're going to see that so there might have been another indication on radar that just might be an un unsubstantiated rumor uh, there could be a variety of things maybe something came up on a radar report uh, a minute or two after mm -hmm. it initially dropped off radar so there, there could be a way that they might have seen uh, that the aircraft travels a different direction. Just really, really quickly, let me wrap it up. Um, Interpol has a database that that keeps track of stolen passports. We have this report of stolen passports, which raises a lot of suspicion that some type of foul play might have happened here. But that doesn't necessarily mean terrorism, right? I mean, that could also mean smuggling or some other illicit activity. But, um, you know, does that raise a, a red flag for you too? The stolen passports issue gives me pause. 
Uh, absolutely, it would give anyone pause uh, it, because people travel on stolen documents, fraudulent documents all the time, including stolen passports. Uh, in this case, with the mysterious nature of the disappearance of the plane, that's something investigators definitely will have to look at. Absolutely. Unfortunately, Asia is notorious for lax security in this respect, and um, perhaps the terrorists or whoever, presuming, know that, which is uh, another area of this that we need to keep a close eye on. Jeff, thank you so much. Absolutely, Tara. Thank you. After the break, we know progressivism has been flourishing at American universities for decades. But has it done so at the expense of free speech? Ellison Barber takes a look next.